Alrighty, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Nate. I also go by Hockey Boy in Nate. And today we're going to be discussing the severe weather threat for the mid parts of this week into the later parts of next week. Actually, I'll say the later parts of this week. Um, first things first, this is a video that I'm recording on my laptop, so if quality sucks, don't blame me. I'm on vacation. So. Just trying to get the word out. If it sucks, just listen to my voice and you'll probably be able to hear exactly what I'm talking about. Or at least for the most part, uh, from the beginning to the middle part of the video. Um, but if you do like the content that I provide, um, you can look back in some of my other videos to where it's better quality and uh, be able to understand that what I do is I upload videos almost every single day, uh, particularly in the mornings. And then I also live stream during the events um, if they're like that bad, which I can't live stream on Thursday. Um, I said I might chase, but we're renting out a Lincoln Continental and it's kind of not a good idea to drive a luxury car into a severe storm. So <laughs> it's not my idea. We were supposed to get an SUV, but we got a Lincoln Continental anyway. So it is what it is. Um, but if you guys want to uh, see more of this content please be sure to subscribe hit the notification bell and then leave a like on this video so other people can stay informed as to what weather is going on in the united states as well as share this with friends and family and on social media but with that being said let's take a look at the storm prediction center real quickly we can take a look across the board that uh, there is a marginal risk today there's uh, one marginal risk that uh, sits over the Ohio River Valley into the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, that'll include parts of southern Iowa into western parts of Illinois and northern parts of Missouri. And then there's another marginal risk that is in southern to central Louisiana, all the way to southern Mississippi and southern Alabama, right on the border of the uh, panhandle of Florida. So that's something to keep in mind there. Let's get a bit more in depth as to um, what people can see from this risk here. Um, by the way, if you see these little, like this little squiggly line going around, um, this is actually a touchscreen laptop. As trash as this laptop is, it is a touchscreen, so I can actually navigate it with that as well, and it's kind of pretty cool. Um, but you can see there is a 5% chance for hail, which is mainly localized into western parts of Illinois and northeastern parts of Missouri, as well as for southern parts of Louisiana, southern parts of Mississippi, all the way into southern parts of Alabama. Um, so the following areas could experience a 5% chance of you seeing one inch hail or larger within 25 miles of a point. New Orleans, Louis, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, St. Louis, Missouri, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, you guys could definitely start to get into the action uh, later on today. Uh, just by me making this video, there's actually a, a mesoscale discussion that there could be a, a watch issued for the areas in the Deep South. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Gusty winds, a bit more widespread up in the north, uh, but it's the same in the south. So the south... Um, could see gusty winds in upwards of, well, actually, both areas could see, what am I saying? Both areas could see uh, gusty winds, a 5% chance of 58 mile per hour winds or above within 25 miles of a point. So as I mentioned before, uh, southern to uh, central Louisiana, all the way up into southern Mississippi and to southern, uh, very much so southern Alabama near Mobile, uh, you guys could see that 5%. Uh, the Florida Panhandle kind of gets out of this risk for the most part. So that is the good news for you all. But I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some lingering thunderstorms past this event towards the, uh, the evening and overnight hours. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then you also have your wind risk up in the north near the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, the southern parts of Iowa into northeastern and north central parts of Missouri and western parts of Illinois. And then you also have your tornado risk here. Um, this is practically the same as the wind risk um, in regards to who's getting impacted. Um, but you do have a 2% chance of you seeing a tornado within uh, 25 miles of a point. 
no hatch risk whatsoever. So uh, this is forecasted to be, uh, if you were to get a tornado warning or if you did have a tornado that spawned, it would be below the EF2 parameters. But I would not be surprised um, if you guys saw a, the chance for a tornado, especially up near the areas near uh, Iowa, Missouri, and Illinois. I think you guys have actually had the... Uh, have the greater chance of spawning tornadoes up in those areas compared to the deep south. Uh, let's move on to the day two outlook here and um, we'll be able to see as soon as it loads that there is a slight risk uh, there in Arkansas, northern Louisiana and western Mississippi. Uh, you guys actually had a couple of tornadoes in the outbreak um, on the past Wednesday so last week you guys had a couple of tornadoes but um, the reason why you guys actually have a slight risk is not because of tornadoes right now, or at least I don't think it's for tornadoes. Uh, I haven't checked ever since, what, 30 minutes ago, so I'm assuming it's the same. But the reason why you actually have a slight risk is because your hail, um, hail risk actually is up to 15%. So um, your 5% extends uh, right to the westernmost part of Alabama down into the uh, New Orleans area. So Biloxi, you actually get into the action as well. Uh, Memphis all the way into north central Arkansas doesn't get all the way to Missouri so uh, just a little bit north of of uh, Little Rock uh, you guys get into the uh, 5% action all the way down into central Oklahoma and down into central Texas uh, almost closer towards the uh, border of Mexico but it's kind of this like elongated line that goes through Dallas and Fort Worth so that's something to keep in mind as well. And then you also have your 15%, which includes Monroe, maybe a little bit of Jackson and Mississippi, uh, all the way down into uh, south central parts of Arkansas. So your 15% and your 5% is both localized uh, within those areas. And then your um, basically what those means for your percentages is you have a 5 or a 15% chance of you seeing a 1 inch size tail or larger within 25 miles of, of a point. So that's something to keep in mind there. Then we move on to our wind risk. Not a very high wind risk, honestly. Uh, it's mainly localized uh, within Dallas, Fort Worth, and Oklahoma City. So it's just kind of like this uh, cold front that'll develop, this uh, mini cold front that'll push on through. So you have your 5% that's all the way from Oklahoma City down into uh, Plano, Texas, and further down south, uh, almost closer towards the border. So it's really localized into central texas not any further east not any further west so if people are uh, over in lubbock or in amarillo or if people are in houston are uh, trying to wonder if they're going to get into this action uh, for the wind risk no not really uh hail doesn't look like it either but you guys might see some uh, passing showers that move on through so that's something to keep in mind as well and then you have your tornado risk. Uh, this is another one of those things to where out in front of the uh, cold front, you guys could experience some tornadic conditions if you have some supercells that develop, uh, which is the reason why there's that 15% chance for hail because if supercells do develop, they very easily could produce large hail. So you have your 2%, which uh, goes all the way down from Biloxi all the way into New Orleans, all the way up into places like Shreveport, Texarkana, uh, all the way over into Monroe and uh, very southernmost parts of Arkansas. Jackson, Mississippi also gets into the action, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Then um, this is the event that I really do want to talk about here. This is the Day 3 Outlook. We were talking about this in some of our videos prior to me going to vacation. I said there was a chance for some severe weather to occur within these areas, and I tried to get the tried to get the word out. Uh, not really a lot of people were talking about this. Uh, they were just talking about these like rounds of thunderstorms as to what all could be happening. Uh, but I was, I had an, I had an idea that with the low pressure system that's going back into the uh, deep south, you guys could easily see another event. Um, like not an event to the magnitude, you know, no one can predict that. But you know, I easily could see another severe weather event. And in this case, uh, the storm prediction center is. Uh, doing the exact same thing that they did before and they're not taking this event lightly. They are uh, pretty adamant that this is uh, most likely going to happen. So you have your marginal risk that extends all the way into central Ohio uh, with Columbus in sight 
as well as um, Indianapolis down into southern Illinois, southern Mississippi, all the way down into northeastern or northwestern parts of Arkansas, down into south uh, southeastern parts of Oklahoma, and eastern parts of Texas. It does seem as if Dallas-Fort Worth is out of this risk here on Thursday, so that is the good news. Uh, this also this marginal also extends into uh, central to northern uh, northeastern parts of Kentucky, western parts of West Virginia, into northeastern parts of Tennessee. The uh, basically the Appalachians following down into Georgia, except for in Georgia when it, it turns into a slight risk, but we'll get into that later. Uh, Tallahassee also looks to be in the risk here, maybe. Uh, it's right on the border of the marginal risk, so that's something to keep in mind. But marginal and uh, general thunderstorms. You guys could easily see some thunderstorms overnight, in my honest opinion. Then you have your slight risk. Your slight risk extends uh, from the extreme southernmost parts of Illinois down into Missouri, all the way into much of Arkansas, except for the northwestern part, uh, into eastern Texas. Uh, so Houston, you guys are actually in this risk as well. Um, Little Rock, you guys are in this. New Orleans, you're in this. Lake Charles, you're in this. Um, all the way over into Biloxi, you guys are also in this, into uh, Pensacola. Pensacola, all the way up into the uh, southwestern parts or southeastern parts of Alabama, northwestern parts of Georgia. Uh, I'm not sure if Atlanta is in that risk, but um, it's right on the border, I should say. Yeah, Atlanta actually is in the slight risk. Uh, you can actually see that from the uh, cities that are in the slight risk down at the bottom, um, it tells you that. Nashville, New Orleans, Atlanta, Baton Rouge, and Montgomery. Those are the uh, five largest popular, uh, populous areas within the slight risk. So if you're in those areas, uh, you guys are in a slight risk. Um, that is subject to change. I will admit this is three days out, so it could easily expand. It could easily shrink. Um, but we might as well take a look at it with the models um, after we're done talking about it. And then the enhanced risk which actually goes over the same areas that got impacted last Wednesday. I do want to make a note of that. So, um, And this also does, I, I, for whatever reason, I've had an epiphany here. Um, most of these risks, you know, these, you know, these giant severe weather outbreaks, if you will, um, we'll call it an outbreak because right now it does look very very likely that you guys will have a severe weather outbreak tornado outbreak kind of hard to say for now but you know a severe weather outbreak most of these events happen right over the same areas you know central mississippi this happened last year in easter you know central mississippi into central alabama this happened you know, last wednesday on the st patrick's day outbreak it also happened in uh, 2011 multiple times so you know i find it really interesting that you, know, you have your en endless supply of energy that comes from the Gulf and that these areas continuously get impacted by similar you know, disturbances, similar low pressure systems that continue to move on through. And I'm sorry if I'm being too much of a nerd to people who don't understand. I'm sorry. It's just I'm kind of weather deprived at the moment. So <laughs> if you would allow me to talk about weather for a little bit, I, I will be able to um, easily... Um, easily break down this event for you all and uh, maybe bring you all up to my level. <laughs> this sounds very condescending, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, your enhanced risk extends into uh, central Mississippi, northern Mississippi, northeastern Louisiana, southwest or southeastern Arkansas, northwestern Alabama, southern Tennessee. So if you live in those areas, you definitely are going to want to watch out. All right, let's go to the models. And um, we only have one model at the moment. Uh, or at the time of recording this, we only have... Wait a second. Stop the cat. Hold up. We actually might have more than one model. This is pretty bonkers. Hold up. I'm trying to figure this out as I go. <laughs> you can easily see I am not prepared. All right, uh, so we still don't, we, this is still the only model. Um, well, not really. There's one other model that I could use, but it doesn't go to the event all the way. So that's something to keep in mind. But um, just the timing for Thursday, because Thursday's going to kind of take priority 
for the most part. Uh, by the way, for today's events, they'll occur in the morning, which is the reason why there's the watch right now, or there could be a watch. So I don't feel like I should cover that completely. Um, but if you live in those areas, take the proper precautions for whatever watch gets issued. Um, for Wednesday, the NAM just says that you guys aren't going to get any severe storms. Wonderful. I mean, you do have a chance for severe storms, so I wouldn't completely throw it out the window, but yeah, it's something to keep in mind. I think your chances for severe storms would most likely be uh, in the overnight hours on Wednesday and the Thursday. So if you live in the areas that I called out for on Wednesday, I would more or less think it would be an overnight event. And that actually is kind of concerning because no one likes overnight events uh, and it happens when you sleep. So that's not nice. Weather needs to go away. Um, all right, let's time out for Thursday. Thursday, you're going to have your low pressure system that will move on through from the uh, central parts of the U.S. And you can already see that there is a line that develops. Um, let me get my Epic Pen out here because even though I have this computer, I still can draw things out. Um, so we're going to hope that Epic Pen registers. Hello. I'm still waiting. Well, uh, it seems we have some technical difficulties. Um, watch my epic pen appear out of nowhere after I say that we're going to move on. So let's take a look. You can see these line of storms right where my, my uh, cursor is. Line of storms develop. It'll continue to move on through, and it'll just kind of push off. Uh, through central Mississippi into northern Alabama and into southern uh, Tennessee. Um, the reason why Tennessee is uh, more or less in the risk is because your low pressure system kind of just moves on through. And so, oh, good. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, um, this is not very nice. All right, well... Uh, Epic Pen just kind of decided to say, have a nice day. This is not very nice. <sighs> well, um, I did say we'd have some technical difficulties, didn't I? Please. Stop. Being. So. All right, I think we're back. I did say we'd have some technical difficulties, did I not? Epic Pen apparently wanted to kill my computer. So we're not going to do that again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think you're, uh, the reason why Tennessee's in the, uh, the risk for the uh, enhanced is mainly because of the low pressure system. It'll occur in the morning and move on through the afternoon. So um, that's something to keep in mind as well. And then you have your line of storms that'll develop at around the afternoon hours into the early evening hours. So this is 18Z. That means it'll impact you at around 1 o'clock. And then it'll move on through, and you'll have your first line of storms that'll move off uh, at around 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a bit discombobulated right now because this is a lower resolution model. Um, but if we had another model that extended into this time frame, we might be able to actually get something for you all. But um, that's the first line of storms. Second line of storms... Uh, this is more of a gusty wind threat. In my honest opinion, you could still see a chance for a tornado, but it is significantly less than your actual event. So that is something to keep in mind as well. All right, let's take a look at the soundings here. Um, actually, let's go into more in depth, because I did say that you guys would be able to hear what I was saying specifically. So we'll go through an hour by hour. Um, so in the morning, I mentioned the low pressure system was moving across the Mississippi, uh, northern Mississippi, parts of northern Mississippi, and uh, Arkansas, as well as Tennessee. And then your storms will begin to develop at around 1 o'clock in northern Alabama into central parts of Mississippi, uh, maybe even into Louisiana as well, the northeastern parts of Louisiana. And then that'll continue to move on through. You'll have your uh, supercells that could develop uh, all within a line from northern Alabama all the way down towards uh, New Orleans near Biloxi and stuff like that. So if you just draw a line from New Orleans all the way up to northern Alabama, that would be just to the uh, west of Huntsville. And that would be exactly where you can expect your thunderstorms, or at least around there, around there. 
Um, and then your supercells will continue to move off through Huntsville, uh, Mobile. You guys will be getting the latter stages of those thunderstorms. And then a new line will develop um, just to the west of Jackson. Uh, if you imagine a line from northern, geez, northern Mississippi all the way down to places like Alexandria, that's where your gusty wind threat will start. And that'll push on through uh, all the way into Friday morning to which it will dissipate a bit and then die so that is the good news there that it's just just that one day that is really good news um but one thing i do want to take a look at real quickly and i do want to take a look at worst case scenarios so i could either a uh give you all an idea as to uh, what the magnitude event of this event is or b be able to dismantle it to weather nerds uh who think that they really want this event to just kind of blow up. Uh, so there's a significant tornado parameter of five. That is uh, kind of on the same playing field as what happened last week. But at the same time, uh, let's take a look. So uh, first things first, I uh, want to talk about this little box right here. I don't have my epic pen to tell you all uh, what, this, what box I'm talking about. But if you can look to the top right of this, um, this black page right here, you can see uh, a bunch of squiggly lines and stuff like that. And here, let me uh, zoom it in for you all. There you go. Um, so there's your squiggly lines and things. And this is your photograph. If you guys are new to my channel, I will be talking about this a lot. So get used to it. <laughs> um, no, seriously though, this is a photograph. And if you can imagine yourself in a satellite looking down at the ground, uh, there will be, and just imagine, all right, imagine looking at a dude holding a weather balloon, and he lets go of the weather balloon, it will travel in all different directions, it will go up, down, left, right, do loop-de-loops and stuff like that, uh, just believe me, so, this photograph basically takes that path, if you were in that satellite, what this weather balloon would be doing is it's gonna move up, and then it's gonna move to the right, and then it's going to move to the right some more after it does a loop-de-loop. -loop. But that's besides the point. It just goes up and goes to the right. That's the major difference. What we, what we are looking for is anywhere from this red line at all, all the way until it ends. So from 0 to 1 to the 2 to the 3. Uh, 0 to the 1 to the 2 to the 3. <laughs> Anyways, um, this line here this is what we want to look for in regards to tornadic development and what this tells us is that there's spin in the atmosphere you know, if you can imagine this line continuing to move to the right it would form a circle um, so best way for me to describe it is it keeps turning off to the right keeps turning off to the right it may stop right here but if you can imagine it keeps turning off to the right continues to do so it'll go back to the zero so uh, that tells us that there's spin in the atmosphere, and that tells us that there is a tornadic photograph here. Uh, that is also indicated here in the possible hazard type, which says PDS Tor. Uh, however, I take these possible hazard types with a grain of salt, which is the reason why I don't talk about it in any of my other videos. But, still something to worth mention. Another thing I want to mention too is the critical angle. This basically takes a look at that photograph that we were mentioning and uh, see what the angle of that photograph is. So according to um, this algorithm here, this says that the angle is 58 degrees. The closer you get to 90 degrees, the uh, stronger the tornadic photograph will be. Um, so it is 58. It's not bad at least it's not 40 to which i would say that it would basically be dead um but at least it's not 90 to the point where i'm saying it's like not like it's pretty concerning um and i know there's gonna be some questions to say well what if it goes over 90 well as long as it's around 90 that's when you can experience well that's when you can have your stronger photographs you know if it's like 150 then you're kind of a little out of whack and it's basically just kind of dead but if you have it like say you know 95 that's when you need to start getting concerned you know anything that's 10 away from 90 whether it's like from 80 all the way up to 100 that's when you should probably get concerned so it's 58 it's not anywhere near that right now that is the good news Okay, let's take a look at the uh, 
let's take a look at these, uh, bunch of squiggly lines and stuff like that. And at this point, you guys just survived through the photograph. You're ready to kill me already. You're ready to smash that dislike button. Uh, because you're about done with this. You just want me to get on with the weather at this point. And I don't blame you. <laughs> but, um... I did say that we were going to be talking about soundings a whole lot, so I might as well give you the general overview as to what I look for. Uh, and in this case, this part is the uh, squiggly line um, fadoodle cake that we call a skew t chart. And a skew t chart basically tells us what the conditions are in the atmosphere as it goes up in height. So as you get higher and higher and up, they typically get colder and colder and colder, but in some areas it actually gets warmer than some others. So, you know, I find that pretty interesting, but that's still something to keep in mind that this right here, this bunch of squiggly lines tells us what the conditions are in the atmosphere. So uh, let's start breaking it down little by little. That red line that you see that goes across the middle part of your screen, that is the temperature line. So uh, at the ground, you can clearly see it is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what that red number indicates. The green line indicates dew points. So you can see the red number at the bottom, that's 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which by the way, uh, for dew points in order to consider thunderstorms, you'd need at least 60 or above. So the fact that it's 70, 70 is actually pretty concerning because then you have a lot of moisture there. That's a lot of moisture. Like that's... Believe me, it's a lot. It's, I can't emphasize because I don't have my face on, but it's a lot. Just just take my word for it. Um, so you have your red line, that's temperature. You have your green line, that's dew point. Then you have this dotted line right here. And this is where I'm going to lose some of you all. So if you just, you know, take a second to think about it. It isn't that bad. That dotted line is the pathway that it, a developing thunderstorm would take. So if a thunderstorm were to develop, that's the pathway it would take. And just to, you know, try and make it a little bit clearer, all right? I don't know why they made it like this, but you see these white numbers in the middle of your screen right here? It says 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0, negative 10, negative 20. That's temperature in Celsius, okay? So the only thing you really need to know is that zero equals to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm pretty sure you guys already knew that. These dotted lines here that start from these numbers, they go diagonal. Why they go diagonal? I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> but <laughs> um, these uh, dotted lines show you where the temperature is within a specific height. So we'll go, for instance, um... We'll go right about here, okay? So this dotted line right here meets this uh, red line, this temperature line, and this is where it is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we go over here, you can see these red numbers indicate zero kilometer, one to kilometer, three kilometers, six kilometers, stuff like that. Um, so this right here where the temperature is right at the freezing point, is above three kilometers. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, that as a developing thunderstorm line, uh, it reaches a specific spot um, and that when it gets to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it's just under six kilometers. So that's that goes to show you that it's different than temperature or anything, stuff like that. All right. Anything in between the red line and the developing thunderstorm line or the developing parcel line is a weather enthusiasts and some other meteorologists like to call it, is CAPE. That's the convective available potential energy. That's the measure of the amount of buoyant force in the atmosphere. And the uh, way that you can register that is uh, by seeing, well, not really seeing, um, by measuring the uh, displacement between warm air, warm, moist air rising and cold air sinking. And Anything in the middle of this red line and this developing thunderstorm line, this entire gap right here where my cursor is following, that's CAPE. So uh, there's a lot of energy here. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at the CAPE numbers down here, you can literally see CAPE, and then under it is a bunch of numbers. It gets up to 3,484. That's a lot of CAPE, especially at the surface. 
mixing layer is above 2000, which I don't need to go into that. That's just a lot in general. Um, but there's a lot of cape in there. It's forecasted to stay around 3000. So that is something to keep in mind too. Um, in order to consider thunderstorms that could be tornadic, you need at least 750 joules per kilogram, but you need other factors to carry it. Um, so the fact that it is 3000, almost 3,500, that's a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy. I'm just, uh, I'm thinking about it now. That's quite a lot. So woof. Capping inversion, not that big of a deal right now, but some people in the comments are going to uh, ask me, what's the capping inversion? It says zero, so stop asking. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, now capping inversion for any of you new guys, it's basically a limiting factor, and it's basically whenever the red line crosses over the dotted line at the bottom of the skew T chart. Uh, because that doesn't happen, then... Um, there's no capping inversion. As simple as that. Uh, there is a little bit of cloud cover. The way you can tell that there's cloud cover, um, this is basically when condensation forms, is when the temperature line and the dew point line is basically right next to each other. Either that or they're right on top of each other. Um, so that creates clouds and stuff like that. So that's something to keep in mind as well. My father is... Dude, he woke me up at 6.30 and I'm recording this at 9 o'clock. And he woke me up for two straight hours. I really don't want to hear it from him. Anyways. Uh, lapse rates are okay. They're in the sevens. Um, you typically want them around sevens in order to have updrafts that are good. So I can't really go into full detail as to what the lapse rates are. Because you just heard. I have to hurry up. Precipitable water. This is the one thing that I am a bit concerned about in regards to the longevity of this event. You may start out strong, but it may deplete severely because the precipitable water could indicate that most of these storms are high precipitation based. Um, you have a lot of moisture, it could very well be oversaturated, um, and that's something to keep in mind as well. As well as the downdraft cape, they're um, around 1,000, that's, you know, all right, but it still very easily could be, um, very easily could um, be oversaturated and deplete this event. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about the shear. Wind shear, uh, surface to one kilometer, um, for helicity, helicity you would want over 200, so the fact that the surface to one kilometer shear is 406, you can clearly see 406, that's double the amount of what you want and that's kind of concerning as well. Surface to three kilometer is 485, which is basically just the entire inflow practically, um, or at least that's the reason why we look at that entire hodograph, that's um, that entire red line that I mentioned before, that's surface to three kilometers. So, um, the more you know. Someone play the reading rainbow in the background. And the efficient inflow, uh, which basically is just the inflow notch entirely, uh, would be 504. That's kind of concerning as well. Um, shear at surface to one kilometer, that's 41, which is pretty big. It's actually pretty strong. You would typically want it around 20. In order to consider, you would typically want surface to three kilometer to be around 40, and it's 45. So, yeah, this is uh, this is definitely definitely has a lot of shear with this event. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. All right, that's one sounding. We're gonna just do another general overview. This was at 18z, so 21z. Let's go to zero z. Take a look at the ladder, ladder stages of this event. Okay, a lot of cloud cover, but still dew points in the 70s. Cape is around 2,000, so that's, you know, right around the area of what you could consider uh, stuff to be, you know, elongated. It could definitely thrive a bit. Hodographs look pretty nice. They're curling off to the right um, at 0 to 2 kilometers because you can see the 2 is when it stops curling. It starts going off to the left now, and that's kind of when uh, you can uh, just assume that it stops rotating. Um, but you do have your curling hodograph. Critical angle is at 55, which is less than the previous sounding. Helicity at the inflow is 509. The uh, surface to one kilometer helicity is 454, which actually is pretty good. As I mentioned, you need above 200. Um, lapse rates, surface to three kilometers is very lacking, lacks a lot to be desired. 
but still something to keep in mind. Precipital water is 1.71 inches. That's above 1.5, which means that it is very easily could see a lot of rain there. It easily could could be oversaturated and or a high precipitation base. Same with your downdraft cape. It's over 1,000. It's actually 1,106. So you could easily see a lot of rain in that aspect. There's a little bit of capping inversion, but it doesn't really uh, matter, to be completely honest with you. So uh, it's kind of something to keep in mind there. K index, I did not mention this before, but the higher the K index is, the greater likelihood of you seeing thunderstorms in general. So anything above a 30 is when you can start considering thunderstorms. It's 41. Uh, you can clearly see K41 right in the middle of your, of your screen. So that is exactly uh, what you can expect. Some thunderstorms in your general vicinity. Whether they're tornadic or not, that is yet to be seen, but still something to keep in mind. And then I do want to take a look at around 4 o'clock for you all. Just, you know, be able to see it. Someone knocked at our door. Anyways, photograph. Uh, it's curling off to the right. The critical angle actually is stronger than the two we've seen before. It's 64, so that's something to keep in mind as well, that it is getting into uh, the higher amounts. I would not be surprised if this actually was a 90 because it just looks like a really good photograph. So anytime around 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, I'd say this is the uh, worst period of time. This would be uh, your witching hour, if you will. Uh, if you've watched NFL Red Zone, that's a reference to that. But uh, very easily could be the strongest part of the event, which would be 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock hours um, near Mississippi and Alabama, as well as Louisiana. Um, your helicity is around 420, which is not bad for a surface of 1 kilometer. Your cape is still above 2,000. It's forecasted to be 3,000. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Your dew points are at 71. Your lapse rates, your surface of 3 kilometer lapse, lapse rates lack a lot to be desired. So that's another thing to watch out for. Your precipitable water is over 1.5. It's actually 1.64 inches. Uh, your downdraft cape, though, I will say it's 7777. Uh, someone hit the slot machines with that one because it's relatively low. So that's something to keep in mind as well, that there could be the chance, uh, your highest probability for seeing tornadoes within that general vicinity. So uh, if you live in the, any of these areas that I called out before in the enhanced risk, uh, long story short, you guys could easily see some large hail, very gusty winds, and the chance, uh, I wouldn't even see a say chance at this point. I would say there's a good probability that you guys could even see some tornadoes across the board here. So that's something to keep in mind, uh, heading closer and closer into Thursday. So if you live, or if you know anyone who lives in uh, Louisiana, all the way over into Mississippi, into Alabama, you guys need to tell them to take their proper precautions and have a plan in place just in case if they're ever in a tornado warning because no one wants to go through what they went through this past Wednesday. Uh, with that being said, that's going to be it for me. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that there will be another person in my place streaming, not on this channel, but on another channel. Um, he is a, a very, very trusted friend of mine. Um, so if you want to go check out his channel, the link will be in the description down below. It'll, his name will be Morgan. Most of you know who he is, but just for the people who don't know who he is, he's going to be streaming over there. Or you can go to any other YouTube channel for your weather analysis. It's up to you. Um, but... You know, if you just look up severe weather analysis or tornado outbreak or whatever, because it's going to be the title of every single live stream, that's up to you. But other than that, um, thank you guys so much for watching. If you did like it, please be sure to like it. Uh, leave a like, I should say. Subscribe if you're new. Turn on notifications. Share this with friends and family and on social media. Uh, follow me on Twitch. Twitch.tv. Uh, TTV Hockey Boy N8. Please go. Um, follow me on Twitch. Uh, and if you want to join my Discord server, the link is in the description down below. That'll be it for me. My name's Nate. I'll go by Hockey Boy Nate. Catch you guys next time. Peace. Ciao.